for justice and freedom. Good police do not enforce bad laws. Today we've announced a whole range of public health social measures. Are going to be reduced or removed in response? What's that supposed to be here? If we didn't have to face so much oppression in Western Australia. I'm a police officer maliciously attacks people they don't like. What then? What do we do? We have got people fighting for justice and freedom! Because he puts out the last in country. Well, on Monday the 2nd of January, the West Australian Police Force moved in on political protesters outside of Government House to arrest three of them on charges of stalking. This is quite an amazing allegation, and here to talk about this with me today is Rosie from Kimberley Law and Richie from Max Freedom on YouTube. Richie, uh, I'll start with you, mate. Uh, you were witness to this. You were there filming um, on that day, and you've been there on consecutive days since then. Can you just give us a quick rundown of what happened? Okay. So I wasn't there on the 2nd of January, um, but I was there sub subsequent days after. Mm -hmm. um, but as of the 2nd of January, as you can see in the video, um, we have uh, an elderly couple there who, who stand uh, peacefully every day um, uh, representing the umbrella people, um, just trying to instruct the governor or even just to have a conversation with the governor, uh, which is Chris Dawson. Um, they have some concerns about the McGowan government and their treatment of, uh, of citizens of, of WA. Um, so they're peaceful people. They stand there every day. Um, and then on this particular day, 2nd of January, um, as you can see, they arrived there peacefully and then they were uh, corralled by looked like 10 to 15 police um, telling them that they had to leave the area, um, that they investigating a claim of stalking. Now, they wouldn't say where, who made the claim, the claimant. Um, they just said they're, under, they're conducting an investigation um, and they believe that they were part of the Umbrella people um, and the claim was against the Umbrella people and that they had to move on. Um, as you can see, yeah, so so basically, yeah, as you can see, they were, they were then, um, you know, asked for their name and address. Um, they didn't give that. And then, um, yeah, basically the police uh, moved in and, and arrested the, the couple. And for anyone who doesn't understand who the Umbrella pre people are, this is a group um, generally consisting of around 50 people per day on average, I guess you'd say, um, sometimes many more, sometimes less. But they're people who have been, I mean, on this day, on January the 2nd, Monday, uh, they had been there for 395 consecutive days. Is that correct? I, think um, I believe, well, it would have been around the, uh, mid-December 21, so just over a year. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so they've been there for quite a while. Um, I, I'm sure many of the residents of Perth City have seen these people. They stand for one hour a day from around 8 to 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, in a silent protest outside of the government house. And... This begs the question as to why police, when they moved in with this allegation, that they only ch uh, arrested three of them. Richie, do you understand what happened there and why? Why it was well, the they, as you can see in the video, they had some uh, paper with them with faces of people who they may have believed were in the area or frequent the area. So they had profiled certain people. Um, so they were going, I uh, would assume they were going after those people who that they had a picture of, uh, with them. Um, and they were just uh, targeting those people, um, uh, specifically. I guess it's also a mixture of who was there on that day of 2nd of January, um, at that time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost as if, you know, it's, it's a new year. They've seen and the numbers recently have been going down as well. So there haven't been the, uh, that support in numbers as there was previously. 
so perhaps the police have taken that as an opportunity to try and uh, squash the, the, the peaceful protests out the front, uh, which is what resulted, basically. A softer target. Mm. Rosie, what can you tell us about this allegation of stalking and why you think stalking is just an outrageous claim? Look, I have a few theories and I have to put in the preamble that anything I say here isn't legal advice. If you're affected, you have to go and see a lawyer so that they can look at all of the circumstances and the actual charges. My understanding of what the police is doing, now they're claiming there is a complainant. Now, there are a few issues that arise out of there being a complainant. From one of the comments I've seen on Facebook, it looks like the complainant is actually the governor's wife. So that she is the one who is claiming that she's being stalked, which just adds this level of confusion because she is the governor's wife. She's living living in government house. Government house is a public building that is their residence for the duration of the term of the governor. Hmm. And the umbrella people were standing for an hour a day well before Mr Dawson became governor. So it's obviously a political protest. We can prove that this was a political protest. Now, the, the problem with stalking, which technically you can say it was stalking if you look at the very broad definition of stalking, but there's a few other sections of the Western Australian Criminal Code that kick in where the police, I understand they haven't actually charged anyone with stalking. My understanding now is that the people who were charged have been charged with failure to give their details. And you must give your details to police when asked. Yeah, we saw a fair bit of that in your videos, Richie. Um, can you, were you witness to any of these um, resistant resistance moves to being arrested? Um, I wasn't a witness to those people in particular. Was, yeah. Uh, uh, the first one, but I was uh, in terms of um, the, the, the gentleman with the, who got the move on the recent video, uh, Stuart. Um, he did give his name and details, um, just, just uh, which is the, I believe the more pragmatic thing to do. He didn't want to get arrested and you know, taken away, etc. So, yeah, that, that's all I was witness to. So, um, Rosie, did you want to just uh, quickly outline for people why you always give your name and details to the police? Because it's an offence not to. It's a, There is a law that says you must give your name and address and failure to do so can lead to your arrest. And, of course, you don't want to be arrested at all. You don't want to be charged with anything because the minute that you're charged, you have bail conditions put on you because they're not going to keep you in jail if, for failing to give your name and address because it's a low-level offence. But they will give you bail conditions, and those bail conditions invariably say you cannot go back to the place where you were arrested and you cannot associate with the people who you were with when you were arrested. Right. It's, and I think that's the end game. And, Richie, I, I think I saw in your video that um, those people who were arrested are originally um, continued to attend, but they were standing on the other side of the main road there. Is that right or no? Um, I believe not the couple from the second um, but I believe previous arrests back in December and, and November, I believe there was one or two people that may have been, been there. Doing that, that, yeah. And that's also not advisable, is it, Rosie? You, you should just stay right away when that occurs. And, um, you know, at that point you've entered into the system, so at that point you need to play the game, correct? Yes, but you can, I mean, because they're getting you on something that you actually have done, you know, you have actually failed to give your details, 
you can't even argue that, you know, the, it should be dismissed. Mm. So you are really at um, the mercy of the police prosecutor who decides, you know, are we going to proceed with this now? And, you know, if if they call it on very quickly and you do a guilty plea immediately, then you get whatever the conditions are that you're given. So, you know, but the bail conditions go. And but that's it's where likely you find yourself in more trouble. Yeah, but it's likely that one of the conditions that will be placed on you is that you're not allowed to associate with people for like twelve months. Mm. So this is about shutting down the protesters because they're not actually legally allowed to shut down protesters. You have a legal right, and it's even in the Western Australian Criminal Code. You have the right to protest, and it's a protected right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So when these people are standing out front of government house and they're all peaceful, they're not obstructing um, other people, other users of the footpath. Um, they're not c- creating a racket. Uh, they're fully within their right to stand there every day for the next five, ten years if they they feel necessary to do so. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this, um, where do you think this um, allegation came from? I mean, it's it's a fascinating way of trying to approach the situation. I mean, stalking. It, I, I've attended the Umbrella Group as a, as a, an independent um, media journalist, if you want to say that, uh, and I've never seen anyone in the vicinity or any other uh, part of that group uh, following the governor around, um, waiting for their car to exit and then jumping in another car and following that car. There's been no stalking whatsoever. How do you think they – they? what do you think the mindset around this is? Because I'm interested in getting into it because we've been witnessing police making stuff up quite a lot in the past, in the past year, two years. What's going on here, Rosie? Look, I personally, and again, this is my personal opinion, I think the stalking charge is a pretext to get people to get in trouble because they know by now with all of their many interactions with different protesters, it's all protesters believe that they have the right to not give their name and address. And because it is an offence, they do get charged with a criminal offence. And most of the protesters get charged with only that offence because it's the only criminal offence they've actually committed Mm -hmm. because the police know they can't stop you from protesting. And I have this this feeling that perhaps, see, that the governor's wife is also the wife of the former police commissioner and a former police officer. I suggest that over the term of this relationship, she has, you know, once or twice been in a discussion with her husband about what the law says. And there is a section, and actually there's a couple of them, and I'll just read you out the sections and the titles of those to see if perhaps there wasn't a real complaint made. That's just me. I'm just spitballing because it's actually very, very serious when you report a crime that isn't happening. Mm -hmm. So Section 134 is conspiracy to commence false prosecution. So this is where the police set up people to commit an offence and, you know, they claim that they've committed an offence and then the prosecutor actually prosecutes. There's Section 135, which is conspiring to pervert the course of justice. It's a conspiracy to convert... uh, pervert the course of justice if you are, you know, doing these things. Now, Section 75 
That's the one that's really critical for everybody to know. It's interfering with political liberty. And this one I want to read out for you, the whole section. Please. Any person who by violence or by threats or intimidation of any kind hinders or interferes with the free exercise of any political right by another person is guilty of a crime and is liable to imprisonment for three years. A summary conviction penalty, imprisonment for 12 months and a fine of $12,000. There is no no rider that says, oh, unless you are authorised to do so. The police have no authority to disrupt peaceful protesters who aren't breaking the law. So, Rosie, um, are your, just from that, what I'm reading out of that is that, number one, uh, the governor slash the governor's wife have exposed themselves to an offence, very serious offence, and so have the police force. I believe so. Because if the governor's wife actually was the complainant and she says, hey, look, guys, I'm being stalked. I feel intimidated by these people standing here. When she knows full well that they are peaceful protesters addressing not her or her husband, the protesters are addressing the office of the governor of Western Australia. That is a high office that has the responsibility to listen to the people of Western Australia. And he's not listening. And, you know, to actually interfere with that right, that's a serious criminal offence, which is why I sort of doubt that it happened. I think this is just some bright spark at the police force said, why don't we threaten them with stalking? Because it it, it fits. If you look at the stalking offence, It does fit. You can be accused of stalking if for an hour a day you stand in front of someone's house. Except for the fact that it's a public office, it's a public building, it's a public street, the whole Uh, lot. You you, you can't, yeah. Yeah, but... You're not following them around outside of that. It's just literally at that public house. No, you don't have to follow them around. If you are there every day at the same time. And, I mean, I, do, I doubt that the protesters know whether the governor is actually in residence at the time or not. Yep. They just stand there hoping he's inside, seeing them, and he's going to act. Yeah, because I was going to add, it's, it's certainly not, I mean, to be the governor of a state or a country, it's a statesmanly position. Uh, it's certainly very unstatesmanly of the governor, whether it be his wife or himself, it, it does seem like a little bit of a strange move. I'm not saying that the ex-COVID commander is um, very statesmanly at all, but you would expect them to behave in a very official um, kind of worthy manner, and this does not fit at all, right? Right. Um, One of the biggest problems I have, and this is, again, me speaking as me who observes things, my thinking at this stage is if the governor's wife really did report and make a complaint, if it happened, and I, I can't imagine that it did because, you know, protesters have a right to protest. So, but what I... But I can't wrap my head around is that for most of the time that the protesters were standing facing government house, the resident governor was Mr. Kim Beasley. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kim Beasley didn't feel intimidated. His wife didn't feel intimidated. They may have been annoyed. They may have been very annoyed, but they didn't resort to calling in the police and claiming that peaceful protesters who are there for an hour a day Now, my second bit of reasoning after all of that, given the background that the other governor went through this and, you know, 
he actually came out and spoke to the group once from, say that. Yeah. from my understanding. That's true. And if Mrs. Governor of Western Australia thought that that would be an impost on her, you know, she could have told her husband not to accept the position. That's just me saying, you know what? Mm. You can mitigate your, your risk as well. You and can mitigate by not becoming the governor's wife and having these people for the next five years stand at your front doorstep. And, and absolutely, Rosie. I mean, and Richie, jump in on this, mate, because if you um, took up that role after um, the previous governor had had this situation out front of Government House for a year previous, you would you would expect that that was going to continue just, Regardless of whether the the, 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 the yeah, and you could make you could also make the argument that they've got uh, security there as well uh, and the cameras, so they'll be able to regularly monitor the activity of mm -hmm. people out the front while Kim Beasley was there, um, and then now that Dawson's there, so they'd be able to uh, be able to see if anyone in particular was perhaps uh, starting to meet the full criteria of stalking, perhaps. Um, or, or something like that, but so so, but they've got a, a, a look, a, a video of exactly what's happening every day, and 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 Dawson would have been, uh, you know, informed of that before he became governor. So, and it's a good point that, you know, Beasley didn't feel the need to to resort to this and did come out speak to the people. So it's it's not as you can't say that uh, Dawson can't say he wasn't aware of what's going on. That's so right. it's, a, it's a very good argument. That's right. Now, now I do have a question, Richie. Uh, I know for the longest time there was an, uh, an address to the governor via the front gate intercom, but I, I believe that stopped some time ago. Is that still going on? Do you know? No, no. So as I, I'm aware, I believe that uh, they were asked to stop doing that by the police, to stop ringing the bell, um, which they did stop doing oh, – I think it's about three, four months ago, something like that. So a while ago, they, they've stopped ringing it. Um, and, yeah, they were advised to do that by police. Yeah. And, Richie? I, I think there was a request put in. There was a request for them to stop doing it. So a request from the governor through the proper channels and yeah. and then and then the protesters complied with that. Right. So, um, Richie, is there anything else about this scenario that strikes you as a little bit funny, just from your own observations? Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's very, it's quite strange, also, because we've had uh, reports that there's police as well going into Governor's house regularly, and and um, before this incident as well, circling the grounds coming in and out of the residence, uh, which is irregular because uh, for as long as I've been going, I've seen the dignitary protection, which is like the secret service for the governor. There hasn't been regular uh, uniform police going in and out of the building, mm -hmm. um, which seems now to be a, an occurrence. So, yeah, perhaps that's just uh, the, the Governor Dawson, um, uh, you know, uh, talking to, to police or, or doing whatever business, uh, but there does seem to be a, a for all this these events happened an increase in police numbers uh, patrolling the area Rosie is there anything that you'd add to that because that to me when you already have your properly assigned protection and given that he was the police commissioner previous to this role is he calling on special favors uh, from his his old mates or his old employees is this and look a proper use of resources could you make it it's certainly no other governor in the history of western australia has ever had personal call on the police <laughs> um the police have not been regular visitors to the government house as richie said you know they've got their own protection unit and i i, I would suggest that the the personal protection unit for the governor is far better trained than the West Australian Police Force. And I will stand to be corrected, but um, I am a little bit judgmental these days. Mm. But it, it seems to me that Mr Dawson, when he took on the role of governor, which is a high office, 
the Governor of Western Australia and the Governor General of Australia are the highest offices in the land. They sit above, that the Governor sits above the Premier in many ways. Um, they are dignitaries who are supposed to represent the community and listen to the community. And I remember, um, who was the police commissioner, Mr Callaghan, O'Callaghan? Yep, that's... He worked true. really hard to restore the reputation of the police after it was tarnished by bad management for years. He worked really hard to make sure that police had the respect of the community again. And Mr Dawson is not or was not that level of police commissioner. He seemed to be very gung-ho and I will force people to do what I tell them to do because I'm the police commissioner. It just seemed to have that vibe. Well, that certainly fits with what's going on really even worldwide these days where there's more and more authoritarianism in once very democratic countries like Australia. And, I mean, I think uh, many Australians are either completely unaware of this or struggling to come to terms with the fact that this once beautiful free nation is rapidly turning into uh, a completely different animal. Uh, Richie, how do you feel about that? Is that something you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, we can see it's um, it all, all links into, uh, I believe, there's, there's things like the Strong Cities Initiatives, um, you know, you have the Arts. WEF mm-hmm. agendas uh, in terms of uh, uh, tightened policing um, with technology as well. You see it with the, the police drones, uh, police uh, robot dogs, um, all these other things you can see will be coming down the pipeline. Uh, it's, 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 you can see it's a, a gradual process from the last perhaps 20 years, 20, 30 years where police, um, they, they, they weren't carrying so much gear. You know, it was just a pistol. Now they've got so much, so many weapons and, 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 uh, for, for, you know, for a country like Australia where it's not needed, you know. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's quite concerning how we have this, this march of uh, control coming in. Yeah, and look, we, we witnessed that in a very big way on the 15th and 16th of February, February uh, 2022 uh, in Langley Park, Perth, Western Australia, where the police uh, rolled in a van and promptly dis- um uh, started getting changed into their riot gear, which is it was militaristic equipment. Um, thankfully, they didn't end up fronting the crowd with that. They they that was called off, and they got out of that equipment. But for a few of us, we got to sort of peek behind the curtain there and get around at the edge of the van and see the black military style uniforms with padding and all kinds of other equipment. That is a frightening prospect for... Well, yeah, um, and it's also, especially um, last year, I did see a report that they're buying more of the, the Hellcat uh, armoured vehicles and um, all this heavy machinery. Um, it's not like we're in a war zone here. Um, so it's, it's concerning all this money being spent on all this weaponry. Yeah, uh, and we've seen them. that in... We, we've, we've got those vehicles here in Western Australia. Already, I think every state's got those vehicles now. That, that's very strange for me. I mean, I, I, I hail from New South Wales, uh, and I guess you could say that you would expect to see that in a city like Melbourne or Sydney. Not that I condone that. I'm not an advocate for that at all. But Perth um, is a very small city. It's a very, West Australia generally is a very peaceful place. Uh, I, I, I can't understand this, but... Um, when you put that into the bigger picture and you see the kinds of things going on with these 15-minute smart cities where people are beginning to realise that they're, they are being entrapped. So naturally, um, you would want to see some military vehicles around when um, the people start getting uneasy about that. Uh, I think after seeing what we've seen during the pandemic era, uh, it's pr- it's pretty easy to put two and two together to see where we're heading here, right? 
oh, look, it's some um, a scary, scary prospect. When you when you look at places like China mm. and what they have done, and Australia is following the path of a communist country. And what we have seen, the most terrifying thing to me, is that we have no protections whatsoever to protect our democracy. The only thing that the Constitution gives us is the right to vote them out at the next election. What kind of a protection is that when we can't vote out Mark McGowan until 2025 and he is changing the laws so much? And when people say he's a tyrant and other people say, oh, no, he's protecting us, can I ask one question of everybody who thinks that Mark McGowan has done a really good job? Who the hell died and made him God of all knowledge? Mm. Every single thing that he has done to protect the people during the pandemic created more problems than it solved. And had he done nothing at all, we would be better off. And Rosie, now everything that he did and said is completely in question as more data comes out the research that's being done around the world uh, the Pfizer documents that are being released in the US um, everything is adding up to show that the so-called experts did not exist and the the safe and effective claim uh, was completely and utterly unfounded so this is what we tend to expect. Richie, did you want to add anything? Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy how, especially in the last year, you could say 2022 is the year of, of the information dump. You know, all the so-called conspiracies, 90, 99% of them have, have uh, turned out to be, you know, facts that have come out, yet the government is unwilling to even move an, an iota of, of uh, any of the, the changes that they, they were talking about in um, 2020. They're, they're acting as if none of it exists, and it's very concerning that uh, you know it's people can see that the, the information has changed, but the government is not willing to acknowledge that, and they're still doubling down, doubling down again on the same failed policies. Mm. And it's concerning. We see these uh, new variants that are, that are coming up now in the media. Are they going to be implementing the same strategies again? Because you see reports every now and then that they're con congratulating themselves on on a, on a good job that they've done. You see uh, the McGowan government's going to be uh, starting up a COVID inquiry. It's it's most likely going to be a biased inquiry who who writes the terms of reference, etc. Um, so they're all going to give themselves a pat on the back, and are we going to be stuck with the same playbook next time around? And and um, what what's it going to take for people to to say no or to, to stand up and say, hey, look? The information here is there. Why aren't you looking at it? Why aren't you changing your policies? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And of course, we're, we're just to back you up there. We're seeing um, now the Twitter files. Uh, Elon Musk is uh, putting out these the documentation that shows how heavily involved government, in, the, in that case the FBI, in attempting to shape history. I mean, that's what this is, this censorship of the real experts. And, I mean, just from a personal point of view, I I uh, was very resistant to this um, mandate situation because I did do my own research. I did go and reference the experts. And all of the experts were saying that this is uh, not a good situation, to put it plainly. Uh, and yet... All of those people have been censored off the internet or wiped off the internet. They've been uh, named and shamed. Um, and uh, yet we, can, we, we now know that, um, you know, it, it has been an attempt to control the narrative and, and effectively what they're doing is they're writing their own history. But also, you look at even on. I was just going to say on the federal level, you look at what's happening with uh, Alex Antic and um, and Rennick. You mm -hmm. see, they're in the chamber there. They're giving the data. They're giving the, the accurate, truthful information, and they're being ignored. They're speaking to an empty chamber. They're being laughed at. 
it's 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 the lies are being called out, but it's like it's, everyone's got their fingers in the ears, oh, not listening, not listening, and uh, we're, it's crazy. It's utterly shameful, isn't it? That um, every, I mean, I follow Gerard Rennick uh, almost on a daily basis, and you're absolutely right, mate. He's always talking to an empty chamber. Essentially, there'd be probably half a dozen people in there, and they're all protesting what he's got to say, and yet it's all 100% founded in real data. Correct. Rosie? What I was going to say is I was in a meeting last night and I believe it's in New South Wales, there is now a push to make ivermectin the go-to drug to treat COVID. Mm. And it's like all of these experts that have been saying it for years, they're going to have to take now the billions have been to made. register again. Now and then they're going to have to say sorry. But you know why ivermectin was put onto the register, don't you? Please tell us. So it's on the poisons register, the medicines and poisons register. And you can download this document. So there's a document where um, the the minister, I, I believe it's the minister who who made the, the submission that ivermectin be put onto the register, states that it's to make sure that there is enough of a supply available for people who need it for medical conditions right now who are on existing ivermectin treatments. That's why it was put on the register. It wasn't that, oh, my God, it's going to kill you, because ivermectin has been used for decades. It's a it's a very well proven, it, you're right, decades. I believe it's well over 20 years. I mean, you can still find the dosage charts that were updated in, like, July 2022 for paediatric doses of ivermectin for different conditions. And some of that includes, you know, just your roundworm and your hookworm and all the other worms that children pick up. Mm-hmm. So we're still worming children with ivermectin. Yep. So anyone who, who says, oh, my God, this is so dangerous, it, it's, it can be quite problematic. And, of course, you know, I can't wait for the day when they turn around and say, look, you know, we might – make those, um, the vaccine facilities that we're building, the manufacturing sites, we might turn them into hydrochloroquine and ivermectin production places so that we have enough for any future use. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Um, And, I mean, we haven't even mentioned the massive transfer of wealth through this situation where, you know, all the small privately owned businesses were shut down, yet the big mega giants and the corporate tech giants uh, were able to trade, continue to trade, and, you know, Amazon and, and those sorts of platforms increased their wealth by 10 times. It's a, it's a it's an unprecedented time we live in, and um, I'd just like to wrap this up by saying to people, please do your own research and don't listen to the experts because they're fictitious in many cases. Um, we have to start waking up to what's going on here. We're in a very, very dangerous situation, and this 15-minute cities thing, um, if you think that's a conspiracy theory, you want to go and read about it. It's uh, it's a fascinating read. It's quite chilling as well. Uh, Richie, did you have anything you wanted to say in conclusion? Anything oh, I would just say, say yeah. Uh, I'll re- reiterate your fact there that uh, yeah, people do do your research, but also um, tune into independent media like yourself, like me. Yeah. Um, there's others here in Perth. Um, you know, we got. Yeah. Yep. Oh, look, I just want to say the usual. If the police stop you and ask you your name and address, just give it to them. Do not resist arrest if they're going to arrest you. Don't fight them. Do not lecture them. They don't care. They're doing their job. If they don't do their job, they're in trouble. The police force is run like the army. They are not your ordinary employer. In Western Australia, they certainly do not have the duty to serve and protect the public. Their primary duty is actually to follow orders. And that shocks me because the police, the original purpose of an official police force 
was to protect the citizens from criminals. And it's a bit shocking when the criminals turn out to be your own government. Humble opinion. I'm, you know, obviously all of everything that I've spoken about today is my personal opinion, but it's shocking when the government meets the definition of your your local terrorist. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add that, uh, Richie, people like you and I, and actually you you as well there, Rosie, we're now um, being defined as terrorists, which um, I find really offensive. Um, I am... I've never been. I've always been a law-abiding citizen. Um, I stood up to talk about these sort of things because um, I did realise that we were going down a very slippery slope here. And uh, just people, if you if you're not sure what we're talking about, it's um it's a very very quick and easy um uh, go read some independent articles. Go check out the references that are made in those articles and you'll find that everything that's being said is 100% correct. So, look, with that, um, Richie, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Did you want to give everyone, once again, uh, the links to your channel and a little bit about what your YouTube channel is all about um, and any other things? Yeah, yeah. So you can check out my channel, uh, Max Freedom, on YouTube. Uh, Rumble, also have a Twitter, Max Freedom Australia, uh, and also Odyssey, Max Freedom. So, yeah, just just out there covering all the events that are happening in Perth and to do with the freedom movements and, um, yeah, things you won't find on the mainstream media. So, yeah, definitely um, follow along. Um, definitely a number one on YouTube. Check that out first if you have to on any. Um, yeah, just follow along and, and share the information with, with other people, like-minded people, with family. Uh, it just helps get the message out there. Uh, so we can definitely uh, make some change. And Richie, you've been incredibly professional throughout this time. You're, you've worked very, very hard. I know you have, mate. You're, the consistency you're showing is incredible. Mate, congratulations on that. And I urge everyone to go to YouTube or Rumble. Probably Rumble will be the better one. Um, and check out Richie. Um, at Max Freedom. And Rosie, um, you also are producing some content. Did you want to give everybody the links to you? Um, at the moment, I haven't updated anything because um, life kind of hit really hard with work um, being a bit difficult. But mm. I I have rosiecornell.online where I just blog. I try to blog on a regular basis. I haven't updated it for a while. And I've got the Rosie Cornell YouTube channel. I, I think there's two Rosie Cornells. So the, my YouTube channel doesn't have anything yet. And on Rumble, I've got a couple of videos out. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sure you'll get that developed over the, the course of this year. Last year was so hard. We all worked so very, very hard. It was exhausting. Um uh, amongst other things and that's really what's happened to me I, I really hit some really hardcore burnout and I just had to take some time off so I'm getting back into that now if anyone's wondering where I've been um, so with that thank you so much for joining me today Rosie and Richie I really appreciate it um, and bye for now yeah thanks Richie thanks Andrew see ya